Welcome to Mallard at Large, number six. My guest today will be Alexei Pushkov, Senator of the Russian Federation, Chairman on the Commission on Information and Media. Right now is TV Portrait. It seems only natural that Alexei Pushkov entered Russian politics. With his father a diplomat at the USSR's consulate in Beijing, needless to say politics has always been in his blood. But Pushkov shaped his own trajectory and at 22 years old he graduated from the Moscow State Institute of International Relations and began work at the European mission of the UN in Geneva. At 28 years old, he was writing speeches for Mikhail Gorbachev during the Perestroika, the known economic and social reforms led by the Soviet president between 1988 and 1991. But when the Iron Curtain finally collapsed in 1991, Pushkov switched gears and became a journalist. He was chief editor of the Moscow News Weekly and in 1995, at age 39, became the general director of the state-owned Russian TV station known today as Channel One Russia. Russia. His political ambitions crystallized in the mid-2000s when he was at the helm of the Institute of Contemporary International Problems at the Diplomatic Academy of Russia's Foreign Ministry. In 2011, at 56, he became a member of the Russian Parliament and President of the Foreign Affairs Commission until 2016. Since 2016, he's been a senator and a chairman of the Federation's Council Commission on Information Policy. Alexei Pushkov is this week's guest on Malard at Large. Mr. Pushkov, uh, the, the world order under United States dominance issued from 1945 is obsolete. How do you view today the new world order shaping up with pandemic, and the struggle for influence between China, Russia, and the United States? I think that uh, the New World Order is uh, multilateral. It's not uh, uh, unidimensional anymore. It's not a unipolar world. It's over. And I think they understand this uh, in the United States too. The question is how the United States will cope with its new role of just one of the centers of uh, international power. So I think the, pande the pandemics uh, have accelerated the processes that have started long ago. I mean, the rise of China, the return of Russia to the international scene in a rather strong and influential capacity, and the uh, dim dim diminution uh, of uh, uh, diminishing role of the United States on the international scene. Uh, so. These are still the three biggest centers of power. But there are also new actors that are emerging that, that will, will play their uh, important role too. So I think the, the big challenge uh, for all of us is to organize this new multipolar world as the old world does not exist anymore and there is no way back to it. Mr. Pushkov, President Putin never admitted the fall of the Soviet Empire in 1991, which he charged the West with being responsible for. After the recent prolongation of the START Treaty with the US, is there still any hope to find common ground? Well, first, uh, Putin stated that uh, the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest uh, geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. He did not exactly blame the West for it, but uh, I think that uh, he just has shown by this that the world has become different after the fall of the Soviet Union, and this is something we all know. Uh, the most important thing which uh, changed is that the balance that existed between the United States and the Soviet Union has ceased to exist. So the world uh, has lost its balance and the United States have become the dominant power, the dominant hegemon. So I think that uh, today we have a rebalancing of the world after a certain period of a unipolarity commanded by the United States. And the prolongation of the Star Three Treaty is exactly the example of the need to have a new balance or to maintain the balance that has been achieved uh, 10 years ago. Uh, that's why Biden, when he came to power, immediately said that they will prolong the treaty 
and did not actually uh, suggest any conditions for Russia. So I think that it shows that uh, we all understand that balances are needed. The question is what balances and how best to reach them. Uh, Mr. Pushkov, is there a risk of a new Cold War with Joe Biden, who, as he says, will not be influenced and manipulated as Donald Trump was? Well, Donald Trump was not manipulated. That's a mythology that was uh, pushed by uh, the, the Democratic Party in the United States in order to weaken Trump. Uh, Trump introduced more sanctions against Russia than the Obama administration. Uh, and uh, so I, when, when I hear about manipulation of Trump by, by Russia, uh, give me just one example where Trump would have agreed to Russian conditions on anything. He, he had exactly walked out of all these treaties that we had with the United States. The last one, the Treaty on Open Skies. So, yes, the danger of the Cold War does exist if Biden forgets about the fact that the United States do not have the power of bringing down Russia. They have to apprehend this, uh, understand this fact, that they have to understand that Russia has come back uh, for good and that they should strike some kind of understanding. Uh, better in larger fields, but if not, in some narrow but very important fields such as nuclear security. Quick add-up question, uh, Mr. Pushkov. You know President Putin very well. Do you think he regrets the departure of Donald Trump? I think that Donald Trump uh, did not manage to do anything uh, that would make President Putin regret his departure. With the talks with the chief of European diplomacy, Joseph Borrell, in the middle of the Navalny affair, what are the prospects for the Russian-European Union relations? And what kind of influence will the Navalny affair have over the Russian-United Europe relation on short term and long term? So we have two questions in one. Yes, I think on the short term we are in a state of crisis uh, over this case. Uh, and there are, the passions are running very high. Uh, and uh, this was one of the topics that was discussed during Mr. Borrell's visit to Moscow. But I want also to stress that Mr. Borrell pointed out at least uh, eight, ten areas where Russia uh, and the EU have uh, interest to have a dialogue. That's uh, climate, uh, the Arctic space, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Syria, Libya, the Iran nuclear program, uh, and some others, also Nagorno-Karabakh. So I think that Russia and the EU cannot do without one without the other. I think that whatever uh, they think about Russia these days or about uh, the, the um, Navalny case, I think they should understand that Russia is an uh, a factor which cannot be bypassed. It is here and it's close to Europe and we are all in one common European space. So we have to find a common language. Last what I heard is that President Macron uh, plans to come to Moscow in order to find, to find a way out of this crisis. So I think that in the long run, the Navalny case will, will play a much lesser role than it is playing now. Do, do you trust the Europeans to understand Russian preoccupations? Well, I think that in Europe there are always uh, two trends. One is to say that we should contain Russia, we should punish Russia, we should uh, try to uh, make Russia weaker and so on, which I think is not a very intelligent trend of thinking because look at all these years of conflict we have with the European Union since 2014 when the first sanctions were introduced. And as you see, the Russian economy has not crumbled. Russia is still doing well, relatively well. I would say that we, we, we have done pretty well in the fight against COVID-19. So I think that all this hopes of uh, bringing Russia down to its knees are really groundless. And then there is another trend, uh, which we also find in, uh, in quite a few European countries. Uh, the trend is that Europe needs Russia, because otherwise Europe may uh, find itself lost between these huge centers of power like the United States, which are becoming more and more centered on themselves, uh, China, which is becoming more and more expansionist, and, and Russia, and also the, the Arab world. So I think that Europe uh, should see in Russia a natural partner. And that's why I am optimistic in the long run when speaking about the Russian-European relations. Mr. Pushkov, we have a break now. We will be back in about uh, three minutes. We are back with our guest, 
Alexei Pushkov today, Senator of Russian Federation and Chairman on the Commission of Information and Media. Alexei Pushkov, how do you explain that NATO doesn't trust President Putin and feels the need to strengthen its military presence around Poland and the three Baltic states? Is it linked to what I call personally the Crimea syndrome? NATO is expanding and building up its military might about around Russian borders because it needs a reason for existence. If NATO accepts that Russia is not a threat to NATO countries, and Russia has not threatened any single NATO country uh, in the last, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, then NATO should stop to exist in its present form. And so to uh, explain its existence, uh, to uh, play a bigger role, NATO is building up this anti-Russian hysteria, which to my mind is not good for European security and not good for the interests of the European nations. Uh, Alexei Peshko, Pushkov, uh, having met President Putin three times, I did realize he's a great strategist and chess player. How do you explain his ability to play Turkey and its President Erdogan, member of NATO, against NATO? I don't think that Russia is playing Turkey against NATO. I think it is Mr. Erdogan who has chosen this line of conduct. Uh, Erdogan has uh, stressed uh, the uh, sovereignty of Turkey. He does not to be uh, a pawn of the United States or of NATO. He uh, always shows that he wants to be an independent player. I have been in uh, Istanbul uh, on an international conference with Mr. Erdogan and his rhetorics, uh, his uh, uh, stature as such that he sees in Turkey a superpower, a regional superpower, and this regional superpower should have an independent line of conduct, even if it enters in different alliances. So I think that it is Mr. Erdogan who is choosing this course, and we take notice of this, of course, we are realists. So, is, uh, another question, is there somebody like Erdogan you can trust, blindly, I should say? I would say that some interests of Russia and Turkey do mm. coincide. I think that Mr. Erdogan is also for a multipolar world. I think Mr. Erdogan thinks that the unipolar world is obsolete and that Turkey has its own national interests, which are different, for instance, from the interests of the United States. And in this, our approaches do coincide. Also, we have to do something about Syria together, because Russia is in Syria, Erdogan and Turkey are to the north of Syria, and I don't think we'll do, be able to do something with Syria one without the other. So we have some areas where we are important for each other, and then we have a common approach that the world <clears throat> is different, multipolar, and we should find a way to marry our interests, but not to choose uh, conflict uh, over uh, any uh, disagreement we have. According to you, how can President Putin have good relationship with Israel and Iran at the same time? I think that we are also able to exercise a positive influence on the relationships of those two countries when they come into, into too sharp a conflict. Of course, I do not overestimate Russian role here, but I think that to have good relations both with Tel Aviv and Tehran uh, is good for this uh, area and it's also important for Russia. Can, according to you, can President Putin as mediator help Iran and the United States resume dialogue and prevent them from having their bone of contention become explosive? This deal should be resumed. The United States should come back to this deal. And by having uh, this position, by the way, supported by China, supported by all the big powers, with the exception of the United States, then I think we exercise a positive influence on this area. Uh, and I think we exercise also a positive influence uh, on, on the Western alliance, because in the Western alliance, as you see, there are two positions. And I hope that the reasonable position, uh, the return to the deal, which was signed by Obama in 2015, by the way, when Biden was the vice president. I hope that the United States will be back, or at least will restart negotiations with Iran on this issue, and Russia will support this. But Alexei Pushkov, when you, when you look closely at the development of the situation, don't you think that one way or the other, Iran will have, will have the nuclear bomb, the same way as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un has got it as a kind of life insurance for his regime.
uh, if you if you want to have my opinion, the best way for it to push Iran to create its nuclear weapon is to maintain sanctions against Iran and to try to make uh, a, a rogue state out of Iran. If you start a reasonable dialogue with Iran, if you remove the sanctions, if you make um, uh, the ne necessary factors for Iran not to create its own nuclear weapon, I think that there is a chance that it will not appear. Uh, R R Russia stands for a two-state solution with the Palestinians and pushes for an international conference that Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu refuses. Do you see yourself or President Putin can see any other solutions to this, I would say, everlasting conflict? Well, I think that this uh, two-state solution is supported by almost the whole world, in fact. Uh, and you know that Palestine now is a member of UNESCO and is, has been recognized in a number of international organizations. Uh, I don't think that we, we can evade this solution. That's the only solution possible. Now, what should be discussed are the conditions of this uh, two-state two solution. I don't think that there will be any, any, any other plan, because uh, Palestine will never refuse its right to exist. And Israel, uh, Israel will never refuse its right to be secure. So we have to find a common ground between these two just requirements. Ad Arab questions. Do you think that uh, the Gulf countries, which Israel has been signing the agreement for normalization with, uh, can help and play a role uh, to tr uh, kind of mediator, I should say. But can we have Saudi Arabia, enemy of Iran, involved in the process? The only thing that I would warn against is to try a bit to build a coalition against Iran. Because if you ask me uh, whether Iran will develop in a positive way or in a more dangerous way, if you build a regional coalition against Iran, you will be pushing Iran to behave in a more dangerous way. So I would be, uh, I would say, very wary of uh, uh, military uh, coalitions or political even coalitions against Iran. But the bettering of the relations between Israel and Arab countries uh, is a positive process, of course, and uh, we think that it will help to stabilize the situation in the area. Don't you feel that one day or the other, we don't know how things are going to expand, are going to move. We might have two axes facing each other. The first, United States, Israel, Gulf countries, European Union, NATO, and the second, Iran, Russia, China, North Korea. No, I don't think so. I don't believe in these uh, big schemes, you know. I, I think that the world is much more, is much more complicated. Uh, and I think that, for instance, Europe will not definitely follow uh, the United States uh, in all aspects in its uh, Middle East uh, policy. Uh, I don't think that also we'll have these two camps, you know, uh, looking at each other uh, as, as enemies, because China have a lot of economic interests with um, the United States. China has just uh, signed a big investment agreement with the European Union. So the Europeans will now be interested to have a better relationship with China, not the worse one. So I think that the world is just, when I say multilateral, multipolar, the world is becoming intertwined, you know, the interests, positive interests are being intertwined with uh, disagreements and conflicts. That's what makes this world very complicated, but I don't think that we will have these two blocks standing against each other. I think that the world uh, has reached a level of complexity which is above this primitive scheme. I would like to add up one question, if you allow me, about China. I hear a lot, but it's most of the European and even uh, probably France and even United States saying that uh, the problem number one in the world is China and probably the desire, uh, the wish of President Xi Jinping to exert a kind of world economic political dominance. Well, I think it's too premature to talk about that. Uh, looking from Moscow, we see that the United States try to be uh, ever present in the whole world. Uh, it is not China which is sending its military ships to the shores of the United States, uh, the, but the Americans are sending their ships to the South China Sea, and they are threatening the Chinese in their area. And they have military bases in Japan, on Taiwan, in South Korea. Uh, and they want to have more military bases around China. So if you ask me what is the biggest problem for the world, it's definitely not China for the time being. It's the desire of the United States still to play a dominant world in international affairs. And this is fraught with crises and conflicts. 
Uh, would you be hopeful? It's very interesting what you said, Mr. Pushkov. Would you be hopeful that we could have a real, a real one, a real international coalition with Russia, United States, and you mentioned the West, the other European allies, facing the Islamic states and all the Muslim Brotherhood in all Middle East and other areas like Sahel? Look, there is also Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, which is still active in the region of Izmir and elsewhere. Uh, this was the proposal of Vladimir Putin in 2015. Uh, on the 70s um, uh, General Assembly of the United Nations when he said that we should build an international coalition against terrorism the way we built an international coalition against Hitler in uh, the beginning of the Second World War. And I think that's still a very pertinent idea. And uh, the more we move to this direction, the better I think it will be for, for international situation and for the civilized world. So I think that uh, we should move into this direction uh, and, and, and stop to argue who are the terrorists. It's clear who are the terrorists. Those are the people who have blown up and, uh, and killed people in Paris, uh, who are killing people in Berlin, in Nice, uh, in uh, Russian uh, Caucasian republics, uh, in Syria too. Those are the terrorists. We sh the world should finally make the choice whom to call terrorists and unite the efforts against them. Last question. Try to reassure me. I am maybe too pessimistic sometimes about the future of the world. But let me tell you, uh, when, you look, when we look closely at events developing around us, taking into account sometimes, unfortunately, the lack of understanding between representatives of the world governance, don't we have the ingredients of a third world conflict? Well, I think if we are wise enough uh, and uh, do not forget that the world is still a very dangerous place, then we can uh, escape this uh, deadly alternative. What makes me worry is that in Europe, for instance, it seems that they have completely forgotten that uh, nuclear weapons are a big threat. To, to, to Europe and to the, to the world civilization. You remember when in 1987 Gorbachev and Reagan signed the deal about the medium-range missiles. It was greeted like a liberation of Europe of the nuclear threat. And now, unfortunately, the Americans have walked out of this treaty and are planning to establish missiles in Asia against China and probably in Europe against Russia. This is a big danger. We should be aware of the danger of the nuclear war. This is something which has not left us. It's still with us. And I think we should talk more about that because uh, people, unfortunately, people have short memories. We should revive those memories. Uh, the fear against the nuclear war in the 80s played a very big role in the end of the Cold War. And I think we should talk more about that and to make nations and leaders more aware of this danger. In this case, there will be no Third World War. Alexei Pushkov, I want really to thank you very much for your straightforward views, your outspokenness, which I have known in the past also. I want to thank you very much to have talked. And it's uh, very interesting that for all our TV viewers around the world to have a more knowledgeable approach of what Russian people, what Russian government think about the world developing situation. Many thanks again. Thank you, Kasim. A great many thanks for your attention tonight. Uh, it was very interesting to have the Russian view. In the weeks ahead, we will have other prominent guests. I hope you will be interesting and be with us on I-24 News.